Good morning, everyone. Happy to have you here today. Um, thanks for your patience and waiting. Uh, we have, uh, at, at this time, we have got 30 participants. We do have uh, 48 people that have registered, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our little soft launch, as I'm calling it, our soft opening, to ensure that everybody can be heard, everybody is seen perfectly well, and our slideshow works, and we can start with some initial housekeeping because obviously that's always important as we're on these programs. By now, as many of us that have been living with Zoom and been living with um, COVID in, in our world, we've probably learned to do a heck of a lot of different virtual programs. So my hope is that everybody's got their handle on the Zoom program for today. We're, we are in webinar mode. So today, um, as we get started, I want to um, let you know that this program is actually the culmination of our education and empower series that we started in October. Every Wednesday, we were running a program uh, at noon. This is the expanded version. Obviously, this will run to about mid uh, to about 1115. And so um, this will be tackling some issues in a little more detail than what we did um, this summer or rather this October. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and um, start with what will be um, sort of the housekeeping. If you've got any questions, we ask you to please put your questions um, in the Q&A section. That Q&A section will enable us to ask our individual panelists uh, questions after each of their sessions. So. Uh, please know that they'll be available to you after each of the session. And if for some reason you come up with a question towards the end, uh, we'll certainly entertain that should we have time. But let me encourage everybody to begin uh, as you're hearing your participants to write your questions in. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator. We're really fortunate to have Lorena uh, Placencia with us. She is with Telemundo Austin. Um, Lorena is an anchor, news anchor, comes to us actually from Florida uh, and has uh, been in the business of, of news business for a while now. She started out in marketing. She has a double major, both in marketing uh, as well as in uh, management. But I think she found her passion as a news anchor, and we're delighted to have her here in Austin. We're delighted to have her here, uh, of course, with uh, Coleman. With that being said, Lorena, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, move the program over to you um, so that you may introduce Janine, and then we'll kick off our program. Thank you so much, Elisa May. Good morning, everyone. I am Lorena Placencia, and I am very happy and honored to serve as your moderator today. In my role as news anchor for Telemundo Austin, I am always grateful to be part of local organizations like Coleman that are connecting community resources and education to improve healthcare outcomes, especially as it involves breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. So what do you say? Let's, let us get started. Our agenda is full and robust. So at 8.45, we're going to welcome Janine Odins. At 8.50, we're going to do the opening uh, remarks. At 9 a.m., we are going to go over the COVID-19's impact on care with Stephanie Rosard. 9.30, we're going to talk about the perspectives on patient navigation with Ray and Evans. At 10, we're going to do a five-minute break. At 10.05, we're going to go over the collective impact, the regional holistic care. And at 10.35, we're going to do the video on COVID-19, Coleman's work patients, wherever they live, with Katie Stone. And at 11.15, we are going to end our program. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And now I would like to introduce Janine Odins. She's our Executive Director at Susan G. Coleman in Greater Central East Texas. Welcome, Janine, and thank you so much for having all of us here. Thank you and good morning everyone. We're so excited to have all of you here in our audience today. We have um, leaders and advocates. We have uh, breast cancer patients, we have survivors, and we have both healthcare and business uh, partners and professionals uh, in the audience. So we're happy that you're all here. Um, Coleman's convened this panel today um, to showcase the work being done not only by Coleman, but by our long-term partners as well. And there is so much to learn from each other about the strategic and innovative 
um, strategies taking, uh, taking place and actions taking place during this pandemic. And we wanted to showcase that so that you can listen and learn uh, and, and we can all achieve together. What we want, right, is to continue that quality breast health care during the pandemic and beyond. So today is about awareness, it's about education, and it's about empowerment. And, um, you know, it's about our collaboration and our power, uh, the power of our connections, both at the patient level, the provider level, and the community level. And um, I think it all moves towards our vision of a world without breast cancer. Um, as we, we are fortunate to have some very high caliber speakers today with years of experience in the breast cancer space. And as you listen and learn from them, I would just encourage you to ask yourself, what is mine to do? How can I use my voice and my actions in my space, no, no matter how little or large it is, to, to affect change and help us move with this movement to save lives? And so um, at Komen, we've long known it is the power of community and collaboration with our business and our healthcare and our university partners that makes the biggest impact. And your neighbors and your colleagues and your friends have likely um, been impacted by breast cancer and benefited from Komen's research, patient care and advocacy programs. And I want you to know that as we move forward that 360 degree approach we have to fighting breast cancer on all fronts is foundational to our work. And we are committed to re meaning that trusted um, companion for everybody that's impacted by breast cancer throughout their breast cancer journey. So as we get started today, and I hope you're all keeping dry and warm in this uh, crazy weather we're having today, um, I wanted to take a moment just to say thanks to a few people who are making um, today possible. You know, first off to Elisa May, who's our VP of Mission uh, Services. She has uh, led and been committed to Komen in our community and led our mission programs for the past eight years for our local and regional efforts. And uh, she really is the one the spear, who spearheaded these panels that we've had this year, these, uh, these forums. And so to her and to her committee that, that made today possible, I wanna say thank you to the speakers who are sharing their time and talent with us and to Lorena, um, who's moderating this program for us. Thank you so much. And of course, I wanna express our gratitude to Baylor University. Um, their partnership and their commitment to public health education is extremely important. Um, not only you know, to Komen and the work we're doing, but of course, to our entire region. So without further ado, I want to um, introduce to you this morning, the Dean of Baylor's Robbins College of Health and Human Sciences and Professor of Health Education, Dr. Rodney Bowden. And Dr. Bowden has been in higher education for two decades and he joined Baylor in the year 2000. He has an extensive background in research and has been awarded nearly 6 million in funding as either a principal or uh, co-investigator. Additionally, he has published over 70 peer-reviewed publications and has included students as a primary author or co-author on most. Finally, Dr. Bowden has presented over 160 research or practice-related presentations at scientific conferences with over 100 published abstracts in journals and conference proceedings. Now, he not only is involved in that work at, at Baylor and, and his professional work, but he's also in service um, in the community and um, in, our, um, in our public health space. He um, has served through numerous professional roles and is currently active as a member of the American Academy of Health Behavior, the American Public Health Association, and the Council for Undergraduate Research. So please help me welcome Dr. Bowden. Thank you, I appreciate that. I just wanna say uh, welcome on behalf of Baylor University and Robbins College, but specifically uh, our Department of Public Health. Uh, the work that we all get to do with you and alongside you is very meaningful to us. And we're always grateful for the opportunity to do that. I, I wanna first though, just say thank you. Thank you to you that are on, on this particular forum and that are here. 
uh, to say thank you for the work that you're doing. I want you to know, and you may know this already, I want you to know that the impact that you're making on individuals, uh, the impact that you're making on families and communities is significant. Uh, there are times I know that you see the work that you're doing and you see the impact that you make. And I know that sometimes rallies you to continue the work. But I know there's also times when you may not see that impact and you may not understand that impact because it's just not visible in front of you. And I want you to know also that the work that you're doing, even in those times, is significant. You're making a difference. You're making a difference in the lives of people. Um, I think about uh, my mother who had a courageous battle about 25 years ago with cancer. And, and I, I think about the, the work that many people did with her and helped her and assisted her through that battle. And it's individuals like you that make a difference. Uh, it's individuals like you that, that each day that you get up and you, you help others to fight this courageous battle, it is a significant and meaningful impact on their lives. So as you think about that, as you think about that throughout the day, uh, there, throughout this morning, uh, know that there are people like myself that have experienced the work that you do directly. And I'm grateful for that and thankful for that. And there are plenty of us around too as well in the community, in the greater Central Texas and East Texas area that are thankful for the work that you're doing. I want you to continue to know that we need you and we need your help and we need your leadership and we need your service uh, to continue a courageous battle and a courageous fight against breast cancer. So thank you. I wanted to say that to you first off and know that, that we are grateful. Um, I'm also grateful to know that we can be able to partner with you uh, as an institution, as Baylor University. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is we like to prepare our students for service and prepare our students for their calling. And knowing that we get to work with, with people like you and individuals like you and an organization like Coleman makes, a, makes, it, makes it very easy for us to know that our students are being prepared in ways that are gonna help them to be successful and help them to know what it means to be that frontline individual that makes a difference in the lives of people, communities, and families. You know, oftentimes we think that we're working directly with an individual but we often forget, at least I do at times, that there's a family with that individual that's impacted greatly too by the work that you do. And once we start impacting families, then we start making a difference in communities. And once we've done that, then we, we are fighting a courageous battle. So our students get to come alongside with you and get to partner with you uh, and get to celebrate many of the victories that you're winning in the area of breast cancer, in education, in awareness, in research, in outcomes, in, in changing lives. And so thank you for this opportunity for us to be able to do that with you and come alongside with you. Um, many times uh, as we do some work like this, it's just not possible for us to do that alone, right? And what helps us at Baylor in working with you is being able to extend our impact in ways in which we truly feel like we have been called to do. So the impact that you make in us being with you, that extends an impact beyond just ourselves and just each of us as individuals. So with our Department of Public Health, we have a number of really good students at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, and, and soon to be here in the, in the very near future uh, also at the doctoral level. And so these students, they want to work with you all and they want to work with professionals like yourselves that are making such a significant impact. Even many of you I know are survivors. And as survivors, you can understand the impact that an, that a, a, an organization like Komen or even the energy and the passion of students that come along that have that extra bit of of maybe a little bit less fatigue than some of us have at times because of being young and energized to do this work. So I just wanted to say very quickly how grateful I am for you. Grateful for the, for the work that you're doing, but grateful that you're allowing us to come along and partner with you and allowing us to be um, in that work that is so meaningful. As you think about today and as you, as you think about the impact that COVID-19 has made, even in small ways like us not being able to be together 
but uh, in, in person, but having to do this virtually. Don't let that get in the way of the work that you're doing. There, there are folks on this, this forum and on this call that have done some great work to be able to bring us all together and to learn from each other and learn how we can make an impact. So let this be something, as I often talk to our faculty and our students, that, um, that in a time in which we find ourselves challenged by maybe using technology or not being in person, what are the lessons that we're learning now that we can continue to do? So there are things that we're learning now that are gonna make a, a real difference in your ability to impact the breast cancer community. It really is. Sometimes we may have been reluctant to embrace technology in ways in which now we can fully embrace and know that it makes a difference and it can extend the work that you're doing and that we're doing together. So again, thank you on behalf of Baylor University and Robbins College, specifically uh, the Department of Public Health. Thank you for letting us partner with you. I do hope the rest of the morning will be a good morning. You have a great group of panelists together that are experienced, knowledgeable, and can really help, uh, help us all learn about how we can better serve this community. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowden, and thank you so much, Janina Deans, for all the work you do. I couldn't agree more with your wonderful words about this beautiful organization and the impact that it's doing uh, in our community. So thank you so much to you all. So now let's talk about COVID-19's impact on care. And I want to introduce Stephanie Broussard. Stephanie Broussard has a bachelor's degree in Louisiana Tech University. She also has a master's degree in Social Work University of Texas in Arlington and director of palliative care and social work in Texas Oncology. She has 13 years of experience as a social worker with significant work in geriatrics, palliative care, trauma, and advocating for marginalized and underserved populations. Specializes in helping individuals and their families cope with illness and life transitions. Let's welcome Stephanie Rosart. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I just wanna start by thanking um, Susan D. Coleman and Baylor University for allowing us an opportunity to discuss um, today. And thank you for all you do to serve the cancer community as a whole. And so I wanted to start with just laying it out. You know, I think COVID-19, I saw um, this uh, listed as a Corona coaster and it resonated so much with me. The reality that the unanticipated um, things that would come up with it, the highs and the lows, that a roller coaster could only describe what has been the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it, it sums it up for me. I feel like we had to um, brace ourselves for uncertainty and the healthier community as a whole has had to pivot. And so we're gonna talk about some of the ways that our care was impacted by COVID-19 today. So speaking specifically to challenges and challenges in oncological care, today I wanna highlight a few challenges. I just wanna be clear that all of these challenges aren't um, specific to Texas oncology, but things that have been um, outlined or highlighted in the cancer community as a whole. We know that um, as we pivoted and tried to brace ourselves for the impact of the pandemic, just like over the overarching society, cancer care had to make some very quick pivots and had to deal with some unique challenges. So one of the things that I think was one of the greatest challenges outside of just the overarching impact to humans was the delay of non-emergent procedures. Um, for a lot of our cancer patients, some of the um, surgeries to remove tumors or uh, were perceived to be non-emergent with the governor's order. So there was some delay to surgical procedures and even some um, surgical teams saw complete halts in their services. Um, and it also required us to reassess what's essential and non-essential treatments. I recently read a study that was highlighting the impact of COVID-19 that basically shared that it really forced um, oncological teams as a whole to really reevaluate what is essential as we try to manage the volumes in our clinic settings and in our hospital setting. And so it forced us to overall just redefine what's essential at the moment and how we plan to safely implement non-essential treatments. Also, there was a delay to routine care. So there were, this was a little bit twofold. So we saw a patient avoidance, um, just because it's, it was scary to know that we're in a pandemic and know that there's a potential of impact for those who have um, increased risk due to um, 
reduce reduced immunity um, and so are immunocompromised. And so we saw some patient avoidance to routine care, but then also there were some systematic restraints that required us to minimize the volume in our clinic settings um, that also led to reduction in some delayed routine care. Also, we saw, if you just go back just a second, for me, so we did see the reduction in pre preventive screenings as well. Um, there's actually numbers that are available that show that due to the fear of um, contracting the virus, we saw almost halts in, system, in screenings, which we believe the reduction in screening, the reduction in testing sites due to volumes and procedures, whether they were in hospital settings or community settings, trying to manage um, the distancing requirements caused a reduction in, vo in volume, which ultimately led to delaying diagnosis. And so we're seeing a little bit of a, a post-pandemic crisis where we see the potential for impacting cancer care and, and delayed cancer diagnosis. Next slide. So on the patient experience, one of the things that happens as our sites and our hospital systems um, and our cancer centers had to try to figure out how to manage the pandemic, there was an impact to the patient experience. And so patients were having to try to figure out how to navigate those things along with providers as we were doing so. So for patients, there's a compound risk of cancer and COVID-19. And so one of the things that we did at Texas Oncology was try to clearly communicate to patients how we were managing their safety with their safety in mind, but also helpful tips so that they could help to manage their safety and they could be empowered with accurate information as they navigate their care. So we didn't want cancer care can't stop. And we keep saying, and it's kind of been our mantra for the pandemic is cancer care can't stop. So how do we make sure that um, our patients are feel safe and feel secure with coming into our sites, but also that we provide them information for navigating their life as well. And so part of that um, for the patient experience means navigating the evolving screening measures. So I know for a lot of sites and even um, colleagues that I have that work in other settings, um, the screening measures kind of changed quickly for a lot of sites and patients were having to figure out, well, do I sit in my car and call first before I come into my appointment? Or can I come to the door and then somebody will scream me at the door? Are people coming to me to screen? Um, and so those kind of things affected the patient experience until we kind of got into a routine of what that looks like. And I believe we'll continue to see that evolve and pivot a little bit. We see an increased engagement in what the sense of community that is created in the in culture treat and cancer treatment. So we think about, you know, we see Miss Johnson every time I come from my labs. I know Miss Johnson is usually there too. So we have those touch points when we communicate with each other. Or, you know, I'm used to Miss Betty sitting in the infusion chair next to me. And so because of distancing and changing in volumes, that's had an impact to the sense of community that's often in our clinic settings and even in our hospital settings. Um, and so there's a decrease in access for our patients. We see also the reduction in access to in-person supportive services. So as all carers had to pivot, a lot of the support groups that are offered um, for in-person services have had to pivot to virtual platforms. Are we seeing even community organizations that usually um, allow and have networking groups have had to pivot? Um, and so we see this across the board in every area, not just cancer, but healthcare in general, where supportive services have lost that um, and had a reduction in in-person care. And so overall, there's this, this increase of risk for financial toxicity. And I'll talk about the socioeconomic impact of uh, COVID-19, but we can't neglect identifying that's been an area um, of impact for our patients. And as mentioned earlier, adjusting to technology. So next slide. Um, I think the biggest thing in COVID-19, and if we had to highlight what the biggest pivot was, it is the in, um, introduction and increase of access for technology. We have had to pivot and pivot often in regards to using telehealth, making sure that patients had access to the tools necessary, um, and even some challenges in regards to access in our rural areas. But I believe technology has been the greatest pivot of COVID-19. And so um, Dr. Deborah Pat, um, she's the Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Texas Oncology. She's a brilliant um, oncologist as well as breast specialist. Um, I think she said it best, so I didn't want to try to say it myself. She said robust adoption of technology is an essential component of overall approach to continuing vital, timely care while protecting the safety of our patients and our staff during the COVID-19 health care crisis. And I think that's so true. The biggest thing that we have to do is ensure that we continue to make patients feel like their care is a priority that we make sure that they understand that some of the vital things that we need to do, we as providers have to pivot and figure out how do we engage some of these services and evaluation tools and broaden our scope so that we don't miss out on this vital care during this time and technology is how we do it. 
So I wanted to kind of highlight, um, of course, I'm a social worker. So when I think about COVID-19, for me, the things I see most the things I see most is the psychosocial and the social economic impact of COVID-19. So I saw this diagram and I, it was so absolutely amazing. It looks like my sighting dropped down, but it's, it kind of highlights the overall impact. So we have COVID-19 and then we have, um, you know, us trying to combat the outbreak. And then we also have the um, related updates and knowledge that's available. And so I'm going to kind of start with the government rules and regulations. We saw how not only on a, a national scale, but on a state scale, um, Governor Abbott's order to um, reduction for hospital utilization, you know, for us for pre preventative measures in, in case we had an exacerbation that we needed to have adequate hospital access. So we saw surgeries um, reduced and all those kind of things in our um, the, uh, distancing requirements. So we saw that impact us as a whole. But then when we look at the lockdown and economic depression, and as well as the physical distancing and, and quarantine, all of those things impact the, um, the population. But one of the things that I think that's important that we highlight is that the media did a lot of uh, providing information in this setting. So with social media, we almost had a bit of an infodemic. Um, and basically, an infodemic is where we have so much information so quickly, it's hard to decipher what's accurate and what's not. And all of those things impact our population. And so we have the disease impacting us as patients, as healthcare providers, as relatives and caregivers, and as humans just in general. But the disease then impacts our psychosocial status because all of these things are coming at us. This, we have the distancing, the quarantining, um, economic impact, the lockdown and information. And so we see all of these things start to take a psychosocial impact on us as a whole. And so next slide. And so some of the things that we see that are kind of birthed out of the burden of quarantine and isolation, we see a lot of fear of contracting, which I believe is, is appropriate. Um, but what happens with that fear is that it evolves into anxiety, distress, and even some anger and confusion. And so um, one thing I've noticed is that the, the anger seems to be um, related to the fact that when you're living with cancer, you're already trying to be intentional about your living. And I had a patient say this to me as clear as day the other day, and I was like, that's exactly it. It's that you're trying to be intentional with every moment that you have, and then here comes a pandemic, and it robs you of an opportunity to be with the people that you love and create the memories that you had planned to, to create when you're trying to be intentional. And so you have this anger and resentment about how do I navigate life when I had this plan of trying to, you know, I'm fighting cancer, I'm trying to create this, um, and I hate to say new normal because it's so cliche, but I'm trying to create this life for myself, and here comes the pandemic, and it sweeps in and knocks me off my feet. And so we hear an increase in anxiety and distress and confusion and anger. But then the quarantine and isolation creates a sense of loneliness. Um, because for a lot of our patients, the support system that they rely on, whether it be family or community, we're quickly detached from. And so in the start of the pandemic, everyone hadn't made the pivot to virtual, like our churches, a lot of community uh, events had to have an upswing to virtual engagement. And so there was a time where there was complete isolation. And so with that, we see depression, insomnia, despair. And then I think we have to highlight that a lot of our, our, our patients and, and those living with cancer, because we're humans also have additional role stressors. So not only are we fighting cancer, we're dealing with economic challenges, we're isolated from our normal support systems, but then we have the parental stressors that come with trying to manage teaching and what do we do with our children's schooling and family dynamics, or maybe we're a caregiver in a sandwich generation. So we see all of these things kind of take hold and have a psychosocial impact on us. But then I think we have to talk about the caregivers too, right? Because caregivers have the burden of trying to figure out how to support their loved one with this isolation, keep them safe, keep them engaged. And so there's overall stress. And one of the things that happened as, as a, a result of COVID-19 and the isolation and the parameters that keep everyone safe is that when we put restrictions on visitors in our hospital settings, we had families and patients who um, had to deal with death and dying alone or we had to try to virtually engage in those ways or make difficult decisions and have difficult um, conversations via telehealth. And so it created a sense of complicated grief. The things that our society uses to memorialize, like our funerals and, and those kind of celebrations at end of life, were not able to happen as we normally would because of the, the pandemic. And so we see a lot of complicated grief right now. Um, a vast majority of my referrals in my private practice are related to complicated grief as a result of the pandemic currently. And then overall, we see this PTSD. 
um, because of, you know, hearing stories of other people. I just had a, a conversation with a family last week where, you know, to imagine beating cancer and then having to fight COVID and lose your battle to COVID. Um, and so that creates a little bit of trauma there to say, how could all of this happen? But this is where we are. And so it's really about navigating, number one, to make sure that we manage the psychosocial needs. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the support that's available. So for us at Texas Oncology, one of the things we did with the psychosocial needs is we had to quickly pivot. So just as our providers were going to telehealth to engage patients, our social workers shifted to telehealth as well. We wanted to be able to do those psychosocial assessments and not miss an opportunity to engage with patients and manage their distress and offer their support um, just because we couldn't get to them um, as easily as we could before within our setting um, in the, within the clinics. We also started virtual support groups. I believe every um, community partner, a lot of practices, a lot of um, across healthcare in general have really pivoted to virtual support groups to make sure that we're really engaging in this psychosocial piece and not losing that sense of community and support because it is vital for us to navigate the pandemic um, currently. And even with cancer care, we know how important psychosocial support is. And so we have to really manage that and not lose these critical pieces of care. Next slide. So when we look at the uh, socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, one of the things I think that's really important is that we have to call out the health disparities that are just in our communities in general. And so um, this is actually retrieved from cultural uh, the digest and it basically highlights um, the, the impact of the health disparities and some possible solutions. Um, some of the socioeconomic impact that we saw with COVID-19 um, is insufficient of supply of basic needs and essentials. I mean, I know you guys remember everybody rushing out for toilet paper and having this shortage. And so think about those people who had an economic challenge and everyone's rushing to get these supplies. But if you have an economic deficit, how do you manage that? If your resources only come in at a certain time and there's resource scarcity, and that creates a sense of anxiety for you because you have to meet those needs. And then we see the financial losses. We see business close, businesses closing, production in force. Um, so we see those impacts. And then loss of insurance coverage comes with the loss of employment and increase in transportation barriers. This is something I wanted to highlight very specifically because transportation is a barrier for in general cancer care. We know it to be so. But you highlight the fact that people who use public transportation to get to treatments now can't do that safely. So we really had to work with partnering with community organizations and our foundation and um, really grassroots organizations to really figure out how can we help patients in this way to eliminate, elim eliminate <laughs> the barriers that the pandemic was creating and pivot quickly so that people can continue to get the cancer care that they need. And it's important to note that a lot of the community services and agencies that provide financial support for individuals who are dealing with economic strain, um, we're also dealing with deficits themselves because if the general economy is struggling and people don't donate as much. And so it's important to figure out how to pivot. And so some of those things that we did is, I'm so proud of our social work team and I, I'm part of AOSW and other organizations as well, where across the board, you hear social workers talking about going back to that almost beating the pavement, where you're having to call agency by agency, church by church, community partners to say, hey, you guys have resources. Hey, we have this patient, this is the need. And so it really required some of us to kind of go back to those old school methods where some of us were pivoting to the future. And so some things that we saw was, you know, um, communities rallied to assist with housing and financial support. We saw schools so supporting um, nutritional needs across the board. We saw payers um, increase their healthcare coverage. For example, when it comes to psychosocial needs, many of the payers decided to um, negate the copay for telehealth for counseling and therapy services. We even saw some copays that were reduced in regards to telehealth engagement for primary and preventative visits as well. And so we see the industry as a whole kind of making pivots to really support um, our community as a whole in regards to socioeconomic impact of COVID. Next slide. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the impact on the healthcare provider. Um, I think what's really important is that our healthcare providers are also humans. And I think sometimes we, we, we try to make sure that when we talk about patient-centered care, we remember the human nature of our patients. But sometimes I think we don't remember that our healthcare providers are also human too. And so this pandemic highlighted some gaps that we have in caring for our healthcare providers. We saw an increase in burnout, compassion fatigue. I guess compassion fatigue was so high that I said it twice. Um, but we saw an impact in compassion, um, an increase in compassion fatigue. 
the vicarious trauma of where, wanting to help, wanting to be part of the solution, but not having a good one, um, depression, anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, financial losses. I even um, in ASW, I saw some social workers talking about, you know, positions being eliminated due to um, reduction in um, income and revenue and the practices. Um, thankfully, at Texas Oncology, that wasn't our case, but I've heard that across the board that there have been healthcare providers who've lost their jobs too in the midst of the pandemic. But then one thing I want to highlight is the moral injury. And we don't talk about it a lot because, you know, healthcare providers are superheroes, but really we do see the impact where there was moral and soul injury of having to make tough decisions or seeing people being the only person present when someone was grieving or passing away or having to support a grieving loved one that can't be present with their family. Um, and so it just created a little bit of moral injury because as healthcare providers, we want to heal, we want to help. And there weren't always opportunities to do so. Um, and we didn't always have the answers. And so um, that's one of the unfortunate things uh, about the pandemic and the impact on the healthcare providers. Next slide. Oh, and I also wanted to share with healthcare providers, one of the things that I, I thought was a great opportunity that I saw, um, one of the things we did was we started a support group for healthcare providers where a, a safe space where they could vent and talk about all the things that they were feeling, their fears of um, contracting the disease or taking it back to their family and their isolation, um, but also a safe space for them to be able to vent and share all of their concerns and frustration um, and encourage them to utilize services as well. Um, so as a social worker, I'm usually an optimist. And so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the challenges that turned into opportunities. I'm not one of those people who say, you know, oh, there were gifts of COVID because I don't want to minimize the, the stress and the loss that we experienced in this pandemic. But I believe that there's some opportunities that would drastically impact the care for the future. And so the first thing was the evolution in the care delivery models. Some of the things that have come out of COVID as far as engagement with patients, whether it's virtual triaging and telehealth and sim symptom reporting and using um, AI to help navigate needs for patients have been absolutely phenomenal. And I think those are things that will remain and help us enhance healthcare in the future. Comprehensive care has come to the forefront where we see that the need for psychosocial support and ancillary services is vital and should be embedded in care and not just additional services. So we also see payers talking about how they can compensate for these comprehensive models. Um, and also as a palliative care social worker, I am so excited that advanced care planning is coming to the forefront. Um, one of the things I, I believe wholeheartedly is that if advanced care planning had been more utilized prior to the pandemic, we could have reduced some of the um, strain and stress on some of these families because they would have known the decisions that they needed to make in these critical times, whether for the first time ever talking about would mom ever want to be on a ventilator? What's mom's definition of quality of life? And so I'm so grateful that advanced care planning is now at the forefront of some of these conversations. Um, mental health is highlighted. We talk about proactive burnout prevention for healthcare providers. Um, we're also looking at resource allocation and distribution, which I think is really important in exploring how do we just make sure that we're doing the right things at the right time and managing um, the systematic oppressions even in healthcare? And we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and a lot of that was birthed out of the pandemic happening at the same time of the um, social challenges and the social climate related to the murder of George Floyd. And so um, we see also an impact and an increase of the exploration of trauma-informed care. And so there are all of these things, including co community collaboration models, um, all the opportunities are endless if we really choose to acknowledge them. Um, I think when we think about community collaboration models, I was on a call the other day and we were taught it was a foundation, it was a community partner, us as a practice, an educational institution, similar to what we have today, all talking about how we can all lend our services for the creative and collective good of the community. And I think that is something that is so important and an opportunity that continues to come to, to light, uh, even in opportunities like this to serve our community. And so there are opportunities if we really just choose to acknowledge it. And so these are my references um, and I can provide any if, if anybody has any additional questions, but I did see a question pop in the chat and I wanted to answer it. And so it was how has patient navigation changed during this time? And so I'm not gonna answer that specifically because I believe someone is gonna highlight patient navigation just in general. But one of the things that happened is that we had to be very intentional about not only navigation, but collaboration with providers, even within our own practice. We had to make sure that, um, because there were some challenges early on, right, because patients, as far as the challenges with uh, changes to appointment frequency and that kind of thing as we na navigate the volume, 
we had to really rely on communication tools to keep those things happening and keep patients aware. And so we saw a lot of increase in our phone time and communication with patients as well. But I don't want to get too far into that because I know someone is going to highlight that. But if those questions aren't answered, I would love to come back and answer those. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We have a couple of questions coming in right now. It is now 921. We have nine more minutes. So I encourage you to ask your questions right now in the Q&A section. Let's go to this question. Have telehealth options been effective or as effective as our past traditional models? So I would have to say yes. I believe there's some care that we just have to do um, face to face. But we've been able to have patients come in for screening or testing or even labs and then have a telehealth appointment to just explore what the findings were of those um, appointments. I've even had physicians who've been able to um, assess and, and diagnose things via telehealth. And so not only is it about having an adequate tool to engage, um, the tool we use is, allows us to not only have the face-to-face -face appointment with the patient, but bring in a caregiver if we need to um, and do multiple people on the screen. But it's also about um, enhancing our skills to where we are able to use motivational interviewing and different skills to assess differently using telehealth. And so one of the things I'm so proud of, the pivot that we made is not just putting the technology out there, but making sure that we also enhance the evaluation skills using telehealth as well. Thank you. How might a patient balance the concern of COVID and the need of preventative care appointments? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad someone asked this question. It's a great, great, great question. And so the reality is, is that cancer care can't stop and preventative care has to happen. And so part of that is making sure you communicate with your provider, making sure that you still ask about your schedule for preventative screening and making sure that when you contact the um, whatever platform or whatever area you're going to for your screenings, you explore their safety precautions. At this point in the pandemic, most institutions have implemented safety precautions and there is a method to get you in for screening safely. Um, so like I said before, we're doing screenings where we'll do um, testing may be done at a different location or a partner site. And we then review those findings in a telehealth appointment to increase safety. So you're not having to come in and out, in and out um, um, as a means for kind of managing that volume and the safety of our patients overall. So talk to your provider, but don't delay your screenings. Um, make sure you're continuing to do that preventative care. Thank you. Next question is, are there ways community organizations could help to support clients participating in preventive measures through the pandemic? Yes, of course. I think what, um, number one, helping to filter out accurate information. I think a lot of our, uh, in our community, our community organizations are where sometimes people turn first for information about where to go how and how to move within the pandemic. So make sure you're providing accurate information, but also making sure that you explain that these preventive care measures shouldn't stop. So talk about ways that they can do it safely. Talk about them communicating with their providers. Talk about them having an established safety plan for themselves, making sure that they have the resources to keep themselves safe, but also that they explore and ask those questions prior to their appointment so they have the comfort and reassurance that the screening site or testing site can manage those things for them and even in their setting. And so one of the things that we've done is in our website, we have a COVID-19 hub where you can answer all of those questions about how are we doing it safely? What do we do? Where do you go? How do you come in? What screening? And also, but feel comfortable calling and asking those questions as well. We want to make sure that we put as much accurate information out there to kind of combat all the negative information that stops people from really engaging in preventative care. The other thing is highlighting what payers are doing in regards to getting people to continue their preventative care. So I just recently read an article that um, some screenings are now, um, outside of many that were already had no copay, some screenings, the um, testing visit has been also reduced in the copay as well for some payers due to people not getting those screenings and seeing an uptick in cost because they weren't engaging in that area. And so we know preventative care is the best care and following those preventative measures and screenings is how we save lives. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to highlight that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I also loved hearing that uh, people are creating or organizations are creating the support group for healthcare providers. I think that's also very important. Thank you so much. I, I agree. I agree. And I just want to highlight, I saw someone say that they're actually sitting in Texas Oncology right now. Um, and so I, I just want to say thank you so much. I think um, 
what's really great about, and I don't want to say this just because I work for Texas Oncology, I want to say this as a member of our community, is that seeing providers, and not, not just at Texas Oncology, but as the healthcare community as a whole, really rally together about how do we address healthcare with this pandemic to make sure that um, our community gets the support they need. It's been so amazing. So I just want to thank all the community partners, Susan G. Coleman, Baylor, and all of those involved are for continuing to have outlets and opportunities like this for us to get the information out. Thank you so much, Stephanie Rizar, for being with us today. We loved hearing from you. Thank you so much. Alrighty, so it's 926. Let's move on to the perspectives on patient navigation. Let me introduce Ray Ann Evans. She's the Executive Director, Breast Cancer Resource Center. Rayan Evans is a passionate advocate for women with breast cancer and puts her advocacy into action through her work with Breast Cancer Resource Center. She began her relationship with BCRC as a client when, what, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1997. When she completed her treatment, she volunteered for the organization and joined the staff in 2004. She held the positions of volunteer service coordinator and director of client services before becoming the executive director in 2012. Ray Ann has a certificate in nonprofit leadership and management from the Texas Association of Non profit organizations. Ray Ann also serves on the board of the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas and is the 2016 winner of the Dorothy Evans Trucker Award. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ray Evans. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I thought we should start today with a definition of what is patient navigation. Uh, and patient navigation it, it has many definitions, but this is the one that really resonated with me. Um, it is a patient-centered healthcare service delivery model that assists individuals, particularly the medically underserved, in overcoming barriers that inhibit access and movement through the continuum of cancer care. That is, again, the definition that resonated with me. And Patient navigation was actually started and kind of defined by Dr. Harold Freeman, uh, a breast surgeon uh, out of Harlem, New York. And Dr. Freeman realized that a lot of patients were coming to him with a late stage breast cancer diagnosis. And that was of grave concern to him uh, due to the higher mortality rates of those individuals. So he um, created a patient navigation to overcome that. Uh, he uh, received, uh, asked for volunteers from the community who were then trained to be lay patient navigators who met women in their, within their community. And they, he met, they met women in uh, parks. They met women in hair salons and grocery stores, wherever they were. And they made sure that um, the navigators were able to to make sure women were receiving and getting their mammography services. Um, and what he realized over time is that with that uh, intervention, more and more women were not coming in with late stage diagnoses of breast cancer, they were coming in with early stages, which gave them obviously a better outcome. And so over time, he expanded his, um, his vision for patient navigation to not just be around screening services and diagnostic services, he expanded them to include uh, financial services and social services. And so he identified, uh, he taught his navigators how to identify financial barriers, such as a lack of insurance, to uh, identify communication and information barriers, medical system barriers, fear and distrust and emotional barriers, and then taught them how to uh, resolve those barriers for their for those uh, individuals. Next slide. And so there's lots of different kinds of patient navigation models out there. Uh, and these are just a few. Uh, there's clinical navigation using nurse navigators and case managers. There's a multidisciplinary approach using social workers, nurse navigators, community health workers, or lay navigators. And then there's social services navigation um, with social workers, lay patient navigators, and community health workers. There are community-based uh, organizations like Breast Cancer Resource Center. 
uh, there are telephone based uh, navigation centers that uh, are very similar to what Livestrong adopted several years ago. But all, all navigation does some form of care coordination. They provide resources, emotional support, education, and information, all in an effort to remove barriers that prevent access to that quality cancer care that every person deserves. Next slide. So I wanted to make a, a case for patient navigation. And so I, I did some research and came up with um, some, um, some studies that really uh, showed the, the importance of patient navigation. And so in 2012, the oncologist uh, published an article that tells us that navigation can improve access to quality care for low income and underserved populations and cities. And navigators can advocate for their clients to ensure that they get the same level of care for those with more resources. And I think that's a really important thing to know. Um, so their conclusion was that patient navigation can lead to high quality breast cancer care uh, in concordance with national guidelines among underserved vulnerable populations in urban areas. Next slide. And then another study was done exploring uh, patient navigation community health worker activities across the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Programs. Uh, and this uh, concluded that patient navigation and community health worker interventions have demonstrated uh, that they can address disparity, address social determinants of health by addressing disparities. Next slide. And then a pilot study of virtual patient navigation program to improve treatment adherence among low income cancer patients concluded that centralized virtual navigation is feasible for low income populations and has the potential to improve treatment completion, which after all is important to all of us uh, with, a, with, a, with any kind of a, a serious illness to complete treatment to ensure <clears throat> that you have the best chance for, um, for survival. Next slide. And so um, I wanted to talk about Breast Cancer Resource Center and share our model with you today. Um, BCRC, uh, our mission is to empower those affected by breast cancer with personalized compassion uh, and su uh, support and compassion. And we actually started in 1995, really as a, a, an answer to a group of women who met in a support group and realized that their experience with each other was so valuable that they wanted to uh, make sure that it was a resource in the community. And so they created Breast Cancer Resource Center. And it was uh, in the very beginning an all volunteer organization. And we literally were a resource center. We had a lending library, we had, um, uh, books and videos. We had a, a group of volunteers who answered a helpline. And the questions that we were answering at that time were questions about where can I get a prosthesis? Where can I buy a wig? Um, and those kinds of questions. However, uh, we in quick order became uh, a paid staff and we began patient navigation services in 2008 and 2009. Uh, and Dr. Freeman created his model in 2007. So we were required by our executive director at the time, a wonderful woman who uh, had the vision to realize that what we were doing and what we could do was so much more than what we had been doing. And so she uh, gave us uh, the resources to, to all of uh, our um, client services staff attended training with Dr. Harold Freeman at the Harold P. Freeman Patient Navigation Institute in Harlem, New York. And Dr. Freeman told us all um, who were lucky enough to train with him that we were to take what we learned from him and his team and bring it back to our communities and build on it, which is exactly what Breast Cancer Resource Center has done over the years. So from that 2008, 2009 training that uh, about four or five of us attended, uh, now we provide all these years later uh, guidance, education, and assistance to women with breast cancer. And of course, we also provide support for their families and their loved ones. Uh, and I do want to tell you that we serve uh, currently a five county service area, Travis, Williamson, Hayes, Bastrop, and Caldwell, with the bulk of our clients coming, of course, from the most populated counties of Travis and Williamson County. And that 87% of our referrals come from physicians, nurse navigators, and social workers. 
Next slide. And while we don't, uh, we don't hire women, uh, we don't hire our, our navigators as navigators, we actually train them uh, over time. And uh, all of our navigators are survivors of breast cancer so that they immediately have a connection with a woman who's newly diagnosed. They have felt similar feelings. They have heard that same news and information um, and they have made it through that experience of breast cancer and come out the other side. Um, and so we, uh, in, in addition to all the services we provide, I think the other important piece that we, role that we play is uh, the, the role of providing hope to the women who come, come through our doors. Uh, we work with everyone regardless of socioeconomic status and we provide support by age and primary language. Uh, two of our navigators work with women 45 and younger. Three of our navigators work with women 46 and older, and we currently have one bilingual navigator on staff. Next slide. Um, I do wanna, can we back up one minute to the next slide? Thank you. I just wanna talk a little bit about how we, what, how, um, it works if somebody's referred to us. There might be some among you that would like to know that. So once our, uh, we receive a, a referral from any source, um, our support specialist reaches out and collects demographic information from our client. Um, they, uh, she'll ask things like uh, age, ethnicity, gender, and address, whether or not you're insured, uh, 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 what, what your family model looks like, um, that kind of information. And then we also ask our client at that time to complete the NCCN distress thermometer and the cost financial burden survey so that we know going in what the challenges are that each woman is facing. Our navigator is then assigned a client based again on their age and their primary language. And if she then reaches out to them by phone and if she's unable to reach them by phone, she may send a text or an email and asking, uh, providing them uh, her contact information. And we'll make three attempts. And if those attempts are not successful, we know that they have our information and will call us if and when they need us. The interesting thing about the NCCN distress thermometer is that, that, um, that the data that we collect in that uh, tool is then uh, auto-populating our barrier section of our client database. Uh, which allows our navigators to immediately know what challenges that individual is facing and allows them to start discussing how to resolve those, um, those needs immediately on their very first conversation. Um, and so BCRC, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, BCRC navigators are tasked with identifying and resolving barriers like health insurance and financial concerns, physical needs, uh, including transportation, medical home, and basic needs, uh, wigs and prosthesis. We um, address communication and culture needs, such as poor health literacy, translation, primary language, not English. Uh, treatment adherence, we wanna make sure that, um, you know, that people understand their treatment plans and procedures. And we often deal with people who don't even understand what their diagnosis is. Uh, we also try to remove the barriers of psychosocial needs, which are great at this time, as Stephanie commented earlier. The need for um, community connection, a lack of a support system, and often uh, we face women who need mental health assistance. So I think uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about our training. Um, so uh, because this is, we started navigating before navigating was a common occurrence around the country. Um, and, and travel to Harlem and going through that training has become very expensive. So we do our training mostly in-house. We do require new hire uh, navigators to go through an online training course through George Washington University. Um, and they uh, are, are required, it's a free class um, and it teaches the fundamentals of oncology patient navigation. So once they've done that course, then they uh, are doing, uh, required to do um, intake for uh, and become the support specialist to understand what those initial phone calls are like with women and to start getting familiar with our database and capturing that initial information. They then begin shadowing our veteran navigators um, and they'll spit again with, I uh, wanna make sure that you understand that the client has approved them to be there and shadowing so that uh, we do have client approval for that. 
They spend many, 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 many hours shadowing our navigators, uh, both uh, as they navigate clients and also in uh, attending uh, the support groups that we do. BCRC does 12 support groups uh, every month. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, then our navigators go through an extensive database training uh, to learn the ins and outs of our database so that we're capturing the data that we need to report back to our community, to our donors, and to our foundations that fund us. Uh, they also spend extensive time going through our BCRC standard of care guide that we have created uh, and learning about the expectations around their role and what is important to us as an organization. At the end of their training, uh, we expect for our navigators to exhibit some competencies. Some of the competencies that we require them to have is that they're able to facilitate patient-centered care that is compassionate, appropriate, and effective for the treatment of cancer. They also need to demonstrate a basic knowledge of breast cancer, healthcare systems, and how patients access uh, care and services that are across the cancer care continuum. Our navigators also have to demonstrate that they can improve their skill through continual self-evaluation and quality improvement. And they, can they must demonstrate interpersonal and communication skills that result in the effective exchange of information and collaboration with patients, their families, and health professionals. All right, next slide. So Dr. Freeman's model, when we received training in 2008 and 2009, wasn't really a certification. It, I remember calling him, his office and saying, hey, can we put any title after our name? And they go, yeah, not really. But luckily times have changed and um, we have seen uh, lots and lots of interest in patient navigation. And so the first uh, uh, certification that we require our navigators to um, receive is after one year of being employed at BCRC, we ask them to become a certified community health worker. And they can do that by uh, filling out an application, proving that they have worked a certain number of hours. I believe the numbers are 1,250 hours of, uh, of working as a community health worker. Um, and then it's signed off on by myself or their supervisor. And then they get that certification. Within two years of becoming a navigator at Breast Cancer Resource Center, we require our navigators to um, test for two, uh, one of two exams, either the National Consortium of Breast Cancer Patient Navigation Certification Program, uh, and their certification then is the Certified Navigator Breast Advocate, CN-BA, or through the Academy of Oncology Nurse Navigators and Patient Navigator uh, Program, which then they become an oncology patient navigator certified generalist. Next slide. And so one of the things that we do consistently is we, uh, two or three times a year, we send out a, a client satisfaction survey because we wanna make sure that we are doing uh, what we say we do. And we ask our clients a variety of questions, but, um, and so far, historically, we received about 14 to 17% of those surveys back with these results. 94% of the clients who, responds to, who respond to our surveys indicate that um, their BCRC navigator, uh, uh, they would recommend BCRC to family and friends. 93% uh, tell us that they, would, uh, they were provided practical information and guidance that assisted them through their breast cancer experience. And 93% say that we did provide resources and coping mechanisms to them. Next slide. Can we, I'm sorry, let's go back one slide. I, I neglected, I wanted to share with you some statistics from uh, 2019 that I thought you might find interesting. Um, in 2019, BCRC provided uh, patient navigation and support services to 1,807 unique individuals in a uh, five county service area. We provided over 11,000 hours of patient navigation services. We provided, we had over 20,000 client interactions and touches, and we resolved over almost 14,000 barriers identified by our clients. Thank you, next slide. So uh, challenges, challenges and shifts in the age of COVID. Um, I will tell you that 
um, BCRC uh, made the decision, shel our shelter in place order came down. We started wor working remotely on March 13th. All of our navigators uh, already had cell phones and laptops, so we provided them any other tools that they needed to work from home. Um, we purchased Zoom licenses literally the week before the pandemic shut everything down, uh, which allows us to do those 12 support groups that I mentioned earlier uh, via Zoom and, tele uh, and telephone. Um, we have adjusted our support group days and times to meet via Zoom. Uh, we have some support groups now meeting on weekends, some support groups meeting at nine o'clock in the evening to accommodate those women who are home with children where they have to be responsible for making sure their education is happening. Uh, and so we heard very clearly that we needed to make some adjustments and luckily we were able to do that very quickly. We're a very nimble organization. As I mentioned before, our navigators connect with our clients using text, email, phone, and video conferencing. I did want to point out that uh, the needs are, you know, they're not different, but they're more now in the age of COVID. Our client needs are more. Our clients uh, are feeling more isolated because they cannot go anywhere, especially those in treatment who are immunosuppressed. Um, they spend, uh, our navigators spend a lot more time on the phone talking to them about their concerns. When COVID began, uh, and as Stephanie mentioned earlier, uh, surgeries were being postponed, treatment was changing. There was a grave, grave concern by those women in that place who were uh, assigned a surgery date and suddenly it wasn't gonna happen. And they were great, great concern around, you know, is my cancer gonna spread while I'm waiting for, for the world to open up? And so we took it upon ourselves to begin a video resource library. Uh, so we talked to uh, physicians from various practices, uh, a, a social worker, a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, um, and they talked, a, a breast surgeon, and they talked about the challenges associated with COVID and why the decisions were made to postpone surgeries and the impact that would have so that the, our clients could hear directly from those professionals how those impacts how those changes would impact them and their care and their treatment. Um, so um, when we, Stephanie talked earlier about opportunities uh, that COVID is providing, that is definitely an opportunity that we embraced to be able to educate, uh, continue to educate our community um, in, in this new uh, situation that was so unexpected for us all. And those videos are still on our, our website. Uh, and can be viewed at any time by anybody just accessing our website. Uh, we have seen uh, not just an increase in the, in the need for psychosocial support, our support groups are, are very, being extraordinarily well attended. Uh, many of our groups have almost too many women in them, up to 20 women participating at a time. That is our max, we cannot do more. We're trying to keep them at 15 and below, uh, which is why we have so many groups right now. Um, a lot of people are dealing with real extreme financial challenges, women who have lost their jobs, lost their insurance. And so we are relying on our community partners to uh, qualify them and help them. Uh, you know, we're referring them over to, to our community partners to get the help that they need. Um, financial toxicity is increasing. Uh, the need for community connection, as I mentioned, is also increasing. So that's the, the changes that we're seeing uh, uh, so we're seeing a lot, a lot of hours being spent on the phone with our navigators help resolving uh, these barriers that uh, for women who would never have expected to be in this place, uh, but all due to the age of COVID. Next slide. And so this video library that I mentioned earlier, we're building it now. Um, it is something that we are excited to be doing. We're using subject matter experts, uh, BCRC navigators, uh, are, we're, we're very lucky to have wonderful support in our community and we can call on almost any physician, any social worker in our community and they gladly lend their time and their talent to us to uh, provide information uh, that we're now filming. Uh, so we're doing these uh, cancer and health insurance coverage. We've got one on advanced care planning, which Stephanie talked about before, grief and loss from diagnosis and treatment, metastatic breast cancer and grief, and then this year, which we've been planning on doing for a very long time, but we finally have the resources and we have the time to begin a new support group for our Black and African-American clients called Pink Table Talk. 
And we also started a new online forum for that community as well. So we're very excited about that. Next slide. So we have a CDC grant uh, and I wanna make sure that I'm not going over my time, but we were, we're so grateful and quite shocked to receive a CDC grant that we applied for in April of 2019. We uh, were awarded that grant along with seven other amazing uh, organizations, including Johns Hopkins, Char Charette, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, University of Chicago, um, the State of Michigan Department of Health. And um, it's all in service of women 45 and younger with breast cancer and women with metastatic breast cancer. Um, next slide. So I just wanna tell you that our success was not, would not be possible without partnerships uh, in the community, most notably Texas Oncology, Baylor Scott and White, Austin Cancer Centers, Flatwater Foundation, Planned Parenthood. Of course, our friends at Komen uh, who have been supporters of ours for as long as they've been in Austin and we're so grateful for that. Patient navigation is important. Um, it it, it provides improves outcomes for most vulnerable. Uh, everybody can use some kind of navigation service. And I wanna say thank you again to Susan G. Komen, Greater Central and East Texas for your many years of support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray Ann Evans, Executive Director of Breast Cancer Resource Center. Thank you so, so much for being with us today and sharing all the information. I know uh, Telemundo Austin has also been a proud sponsor and uh, show support every year for the annual um, raising funds efforts. Um, so thank you so much for the impact that uh, your organization is doing in our community. Let's go over some questions right now on that note. Let's see, the first one says, how important are relationships to other organizations in your work? Yes, um, actually it, they're vitally important. We could not do it, what we do without those organizations. Um, and so community collaboration is critical to, to uh, the village that we have to create to support a woman with breast cancer. And uh, we, again, we could not do what we're doing without them. And um, that's why I mentioned those organizations at the end because they have been a huge, huge part of what uh, it takes to help make a woman, uh, help a woman get through a breast cancer experience. That's right. Next question says, what are the most critical issues being faced by your clients during COVID-19? Yes, I th thank you for that question. Uh, we're finding women are feeling very isolated now. We are feeling that, uh, that we're experiencing that isolation. We, lots of phone call, calls, lots of conversations feeling unsure of their decisions. Uh, and then the other thing that we're really encountering is this whole notion that there may not be employed longer or many of them have become unemployed uh, or their spouse has become unemployed. And so we're trying to make sure that we are, that there's not a break in their care while they're, they're experiencing that. So we're working very diligently, very quickly to make sure that um, there's not a break in their coverage so that they can, um, not have a break in their care. Thank you. It is now 9.54. We still have five more minutes to answer more questions. So let's go to the next one. And it says, how do you know that you're making a difference for women with breast cancer? Um, yeah, we, you know, we do have a lot of anecdotal evidence, obviously we have, uh, but, it, but it is a little hard to drill down on. And so um, part of what our CDC grant is going to allow us to do is to really determine uh, the, the difference that we make. So you saw earlier the slide where we're where 93 percent of our clients tell us that that we um, have given them coping skills. 93 percent of our clients have said that they would ref, or 94 percent would say that they would refer people to us. And so we're relying on that information now to identify um, how our, what how we're be, how we are impacting those women and their experiences. But we know too because women stay with us for a very long time. A lot of navigation services end after a certain period of time, but Breast Cancer Resource Center clients stay with us for years. They either attend our support groups, they're active on our forums, they call their navigator if they have a question or a concern. And sadly, all too often our clients come back when they find out that they're going to, they're having a recurrence or they're being diagnosed with metastatic cancer because we have become their space, safe space. 
Thank you. And I think you just answered the next question, which says, it says how long does a patient navigator for VCRC typically work with the client? Yes, I, I, again, it, it really depends on the individual and what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Some women, when they're done with cancer, they're done with cancer and they don't want to look back. And we absolutely understand that. But the vast majority of our, of our clients stay with us for, for more than one year beyond uh, treatment. Um, and we're very honored by that. Perfect. And the next question is, where can we learn more about your virtual support groups and Pink Table Talk? So um, call our office. If you are interested in becoming a client, you can contact um, our uh, user, call our helpline 512-524-2560 and uh, connect with a, a navigator uh, and um, be invited to join our forums and our support groups. Thanks again, Ryan Evans, Executive Director of Breast Cancer Research Center for being with us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you. So it is now 9.57. We are going to do a five minute break, but before we break, we will leave you with this powerful moments video. We will see you in five minutes. Okay, we gave you a couple extra minutes for a break to stay with our schedule for the forum. We welcome you back. We want to encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A during each of the presentations. We will ask your questions to each of the presenters following the presentation. Panelists will individually respond to your questions. So let's talk about collective impact a regional model for holistic care. And I want, I want to welcome Susan Dawson, MBA, Executive Director, E3 Alliance, Chair of Central Texas Addressing Cancer Together Coalition. Susan Dawson is a Texas entrepreneur, business and civic leader. She founded and leads the E3 Alliance for Education Equals Economics, a regional collaborative to increase economic outcomes by aligning our education systems to fulfill the potential of every student. So in 12, let's say 2011, the Austin Business Journal named Dawson one of the Austin's 30 most influential leaders who have shaped Austin's economy and culture in the last 30 years. And in 2019, she was named the National Cradle to Career Champion by Strive Together. Dawson has a Bachelor's of Science cum laude from Princeton University and an MBA with highest honors from UT Austin Macomb School of Business. Let's welcome Susan Dawson. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here today. I'm gonna to share my screen with the slides that I have to share today. And today, what I wanted to share with you was the opportunity that we are taking across the Central Texas area to build a collective impact um, network for regional cancer care specifically focused on the uninsured. Collective impact may be a concept that some of you are familiar with and others may not be. 
it is an approach to complex social issues where multiple players across different sectors are brought together to align their missions and their work together for the common good. And that's what we're working on in Central Texas for cancer care for the uninsured. So today I wanted to talk about some uh, compelling data first, and most of you on this call are very familiar with breast cancer data, but this is specific to Central Texas, and then provide some context of what we have been doing for regional cancer care, where we've come from, where we are now, progress in uh, the surrounding counties outside of Travis County, and then uh, where we're going, and uh, Q&A from all of you. So first, just the why. What are some of the statistics, again, specific to Central Texas? First, interestingly, which many people don't know, is that um, cancer is the number one killer in the Central Texas metropolitan area. And Central Texas is the only metropolitan area in the state of Texas and most of the country where that's true. In most cases, heart disease is the number one killer, or in some places, heart disease and cancer are starting to be neck and neck. But in Central Texas, cancer is far and away the number one killer. And it is not like for those who are insured. I have private insurance. In fact, I'm getting my chemo now as we speak through private insurance. And what we find is that there is a very good ecosystem and infrastructure for cancer care in Central Texas. In fact, if you are insured, those patients who are diagnosed with cancer in Central Texas have a significantly longer life expectancy than the state average. However, those patients in Central Texas who are uninsured have just over half the life expectancy of the average Texas cancer patient who is uninsured. We also know that if you are um, uninsured and are diagnosed with breast cancer, you are six to eight times more likely to be diagnosed with a late stage cancer diagnosis. And as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, that's so important because of the difference in life expectancy with a 99% five year life expectancy for stage one diagnosed patients and just a 27% five year life expectancy for those who are diagnosed with breast cancer at stage four. And then finally, again, looking in just at the Central Texas area, there are huge disparities, just as we see throughout the state and country. A Black woman in Central Texas who is diagnosed with cancer has twice the mortality rate of a white woman in our region with a similar diagnosis. So there are many reasons that we should be focusing on cancer and specifically on cancer care for the uninsured because of the disparities that we see. So, there is an organization um, that probably, two organizations actually, um, that most of you have not heard about. One is a collaborative of other organizations called Central Texas Addressing Cancer Together. And Addressing Cancer Together is a coalition of 75 or 80 members, including the CEOs of every major hospital system, major cancer providers, community members like Rayanne and many others, um, researchers, funders, an ecosystem of the cancer community across our region of about 30 or more organizations that are working together to improve cancer care for high needs patients. Um, addressing Cancer Together has been working together for over two years now and has made a lot of progress in terms of collecting data on needs and strategies, including some of those statistics that I just showed you, but many more developing consensus on the design principles that would be required to meet success with this patient population. And I'll share a little bit more of those in just a minute. The Addressing Cancer Together Coalition chose breast cancer as the initial target. While it's all cancers that are of concern across our region, um, breast cancer made, made sense as the first target because we have such an asset base, including Susan G. Komen, including BCRC, that we can build on in our region. Of course, it is um, the number one cancer for women. But importantly, we also have federal assets to um, 
to lean on so that if we have women who are eligible for breast and cervical cancer services, BCCS, then we're able to use that money to pay for screenings and diagnostics. Further, if they could qualify for Medicaid for breast and cervical patients, we have federal dollars to pay for treatment. So while all cancers are of concern, by proving out this model first with breast cancer, we're able to leverage significant federal dollars. So underneath the Addressing Cancer Together Coalition, we formed multiple structures and working groups uh, to address area needs. Um, one group that's relaunching the big pink bus for mobile mammography, one group that's been working on the business and patient plan, one work that's been doing focus groups with um, high needs women about lack of access to screenings and how we can improve that. One of those key work groups comes through ARO or the Austin Area Research Organization. The ARO Health Committee, which I chair, has agreed to take on the specific issues of care in the surrounding counties outside of Travis County where there is no tax base because there is no health care district. So that's most of what I'm going to be talking about today. I told you that I would share the design principles that the Addressing Cancer Together Coalition came up with, and there are six that are guiding our overall work. The first is that we have a shared services model so that all cancer care providers are sharing in the risk and the reward of serving these patients, and we're not just assuming that the closest hospital with charity care available is where all of the patients go, but we build a model that can equitably allocate and share patients across the region. Second is that it's transparent, both in terms of how money flow and how patients can access care. Uh, today, unfortunately, there are many areas of cancer care where it's just not transparent, and there may be federal or local dollars that are applied, but how and where those go and what they cover is not something that's transparently available to the community. Third is that we maximize the efficiency of resources that we have. Obviously, we're never gonna have an infinite amount of money to be able to spend. We know that there will be a limited pool. How do we maximize that so that we can serve the highest number of patients with the base, best possible care with those resources that we do have? that it's data driven. Everything that we're doing, we are basing on objective data that we can get from the Texas Cancer Registry, from partners directly, um, from Central Health, um, that we can leverage what we know through objective data to build the best system possible. That it's truly regional so that we um, solve this issue for all what's going to be six counties because Burnett County will be coming into the MSA, but Burnett, Caldwell, Bastrop, Hayes, Williamson, and Travis counties are all part of the solution. And finally, that it's truly focused on our highest need patients. So any model that we've looked at, we've used, come back to again, these design principles as a checkpoint where if we're not meeting any of these, we're not going to create the kind of system that we agree we need to have. So specifically, the Aero Health Committee, which again is taking on a subset of this work uh, based on the outlining our, our counties that are not Travis County, we are working with those counties to um, focus on early diagnosis, to lower the number of late stage breast cancer diagnoses, and to shift the curve to earlier stages where we can get better patient outcomes so that we can reduce deaths, obviously, reduce loss productivity, but also reduce treatment costs. Ultimately, we would like to be able to move towards having enough patients early stage that we reduce those late stage costs and can in turn use those to address colon cancer, lung cancer, other screenable cancers. And there are some states across the country that have successfully been able to shift the cancer stage and save enough money to drastically improve treatment for cancers overall. And then lastly, to really focus on this strategic alignment. How do we shift to the resources that we have upstream to identify in earlier stages? How do we allocate patients fairly across all of the providers that are out there? How do we take advantage of other options to pay for this work, not just BCCS and MBCC, but for instance, um, all forms of insurance that may be available? So um, if you 
look at the model that we have been working on in Travis County, it is less of an issue. In Travis County today, patients are covered by MAP or medical assistance program. If you are uninsured and under 200% of the federal poverty level and you're diagnosed with cancer, there are funds through Central Health, our healthcare district that will allow you to qualify for MAP. And there is a ready path for care with defined oncologists, uh, breast surgeons, um, ways that you can get the care that you will need, but only if you are in Travis County. In surrounding counties, Caldwell, Bastrop, Hayes, et cetera, there are some county dollars available, but they're very, very few. They're typically only available for patients who are less than 21% of the federal poverty level, which is almost nothing. And for those patients who do qualify, there is a maximum of $30,000 a year for any kind of care. That could be diabetes, that could be cancer, that could be breaking a leg, whatever it is. And so that is, there's so little money that almost nobody qualifies for this. There are, um, again, in surrounding counties, about 40% of women who will qualify for MBCC to have Medicaid pay for their treatment. But if you don't, match either of these two programs, which is the majority of women with breast cancer, you try to find charity care. It may or may not be available. And very often we hear from our oncology friends and partners that um, women and cancer patients of all types are unfortunately left to die. So how do we design a much more viable model? Um, Arrow has been working with surrounding counties with every major provider in the region, with every federally qualified healthcare center, but also free clinics like Smithville Free Clinic, Samaritan, et cetera, and researchers and community members to define and pilot a better model for uninsured cancer care across the Central Texas region. So when looking at that model, we have to um, provide the entire pipeline of supports um, from getting people successfully referred through um, additional outreach um, from localized partnerships with churches, with retail stores, with civic leaders to outreach to the right women to understand if they are eligible and to get them onto um, breasted cervical cancer services to pay for their care as quickly as possible for, for their diagnosis at least and later their care. Um, to get them into screening, and sometimes that requires support for transportation or support for childcare or other um, barriers that may, patients may have to screening. Also, again, we are working to launch and plan a February launch for the Big Pink Bus, which has been stagnant for the last couple of years, to be able to get access to women who are in the surrounding areas where they don't have ready access to screenings today. Diagnosis, of course, treatment, and ultimately getting them on to insurance coverage. So uh, progress to date, um, we've drafted a very, very complex through the medical school business and patient cost model that I'll share with you in just a minute at a summary level. We've mapped county resources. Where exactly could you get a screening if you're in Williamson County? What are your options for radiation if you're in Hayes? We've held focus groups. Um, again, we're relaunching the big pink bus and we now have three counties who we're very excited to say are looking to test the model that we've developed for uninsured cancer care. And that includes a very detailed patient flow and financial flow options that we've been through that I won't share today, but uh, that we've vetted multiple times with providers and service uh, members. So here's just a high level summary of uh, the patient and cost estimates that we have, again, focused on Bastrop, Hayes and Williamson County, because those are the three that we expect to come in first, but you can see who's in our target population of 40 to 49 high risk and 50 to 74, all uh, uninsured women under 200% of the poverty level. Um, how many will have to screen each year, the newly screened, the total estimated diagnoses, um, the total estimated diagnoses that will not be covered by federal dollars and the estimated costs and these are all in costs for um, screening for outreach for indirect services for treatment for insurance premiums all comes to about 3.4 million dollars over the next two years to prove out this model 
So uh, where are we? Bastrop County is taking the lead. Um, they are working through the Bastrop County Cares Coalition and have developed a, an infrastructure of women and individuals, uh, organizations that are working with civic leaders, chambers, communities, very actively involved and engaged. They have three teams working that are supporting fundraising, outreach and screening. They launched a three month pilot uh, to, with local dollars matched by the Shivers Cancer Foundation in September. These numbers are slightly out of date, but as of the beginning of last week, uh, 25 women who had not been getting screenings were screened. 20 of those were qualified for BCCS, and there were two positive findings that are continuing through the diagnosis process. Hopefully, obviously, they will not come out as requiring cancer patient, patient treatment, uh, but if they do, then we will be testing the entire system as we identify cases. And here is the uh, ribbon cutting last weekend, including County Judge uh, Poppy, two mayors, and again, um, leaders and community members from across the region who are very excited about uh, testing out the model for the rest of the region. Uh, close behind them is Williamson County. Uh, Commissioner Cynthia Long has been an excellent advocate and leader, along with the group uh, centered around Lone Star Circle of Care, Austin Radiological Association, and others that are providing the infrastructure. They've baselined all of their data. And uh, next week on the 3rd, there's expected to, to be a vote at the Commissioner's Court on $940,000 allocation for this model in Williamson County, which is really exciting. Hayes is a little bit behind that, but uh, we did present to the commissioner's court last week. Uh, we're looking at some opportunities in Hayes to prove out access to less expensive pharmaceutical products. Um, and we will be planning specific public and private investments uh, with Hayes soon. So we would like to prove out the pilot right now in Bastrop, launch in Williamson and Bastrop counties in January. And then again, Hayes will be closely behind. So with that, um, we wanted to leave some time for Q&A, and I believe that uh, he'll, hopefully we'll be getting questions in the box. Adam, we have just a few more minutes to do that. Lorena? Right. Thank you so much, Susan Dawson. And from our office and our homes, we thank you and uh, all cancer patients and survivors, all the love and support. And as we saw it during the powerful video during our five minute break, we are all stronger together. Absolutely. That's right. What will be a message that you will want to send to breast cancer patients? Um, well, I think individual patients like myself, um, I would say that there is an ecosystem out there for help and care. I send people to BCRC all the time because uh, so, women, so many women are confused. There's so much coming at them. They get differing opinions from different people. Um, which options do I choose in terms of providers? Um, there's just lots of help and support. And so I personally do that as well. But I think from a broader community standpoint, the message is that um, when we work together, we have the opportunity to provide a better ecosystem and platform for care. Too many women are just falling through the cracks today. And I'm very excited that with this coalition that we have built, um, we hope to soon be able to get to a place where we're spending our money more wisely and where women are not falling through the cracks anymore. That's right. I completely agree with you. Once again, we encourage all of you to ask your questions in the Q&A section. We're going to wait one minute to see if we have questions coming up now, uh, but we do want to thank you for your time. And as I said, we want to send all the love and support your way. I have a question, uh, if I may. Uh, Susan, first of all, thank you for all the work you've done. It's taken you a couple of years, I believe, thereof, to, to from the beginnings to where we are today. Um, the I'm just curious, and I think maybe since we've got people from uh, the Tyler region, the Waco region, as well as the Cherokee uh, County area, which is our Tyler area, East Texas, I think it'd be curious to learn how did all of this get started? I mean, kind of how did you get this all organized or how was it organized in case that those communities would like to take a look at how they could replicate what's been done here? 
Um, well, first I'd say it's not easy, <laughs> but um, but hopefully, you know, a lot of the traps and a lot of the thoughts of what can work and what can't work, um, we've been through and we studied and we are more than happy to share it with anyone else um, for sure. But it really started um, with a few people that um, were seeing both anecdote and anecdotally and in the data um, how poorly we're serving this population today. So through Central Health, um, my friend who was chair at the time, Clark Heydrich, had had to put emergency funding of, of some millions of dollars through because they found that the waiting list for cancer patients, even just in Travis County, where there was care available, was backed up and they had to clear out those waiting lists because people were um, getting less and less healthy sitting on a waiting list, not receiving the care they needed. At the same time in 2016, um, when I was first diagnosed with cancer, I was working on are there ways to take what we've learned in collective impact in education and apply it to the healthcare space and in particular the complex cancer space. And um, I had a number of oncologist friends who told me, you know, I did my residency in Baltimore, or I was a fellow in Houston at MD Anderson, or I've worked at Southwestern, we've worked all over the country, and we've not seen care for the uninsured um, as inefficient and as poor as it is here in Central Texas. And I was shocked by that. And so we started working together, Clark and myself and some others, to look at the data and in fact the data proves that out is that it really was a huge issue in our community for the uninsured that we had to address so with that burning platform we started pulling people together and saying how can we do this better and uh, we're well now through the way and i'm excited where we'll be a year from now that we'll be able to share that it's working terrific okay. awesome. thanks for that Thank answer you so much do we have any more questions Alrighty. Well, we want to thank you for your time, Susan Dawson. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you. Support. Thank you. Alrighty. Next, we are going to talk about beyond COVID-19, Coleman's work to serve patients wherever they live. I would like to introduce Katie Stone, GD Vice President of Community Health, Susan G. Coleman. And Katie Stone is Susan G. Coleman's Vice President of Community Health, uh, where she's responsible for developing Coleman's strategic objectives for community health, ensuring that all programs are optimally positioned to achieve the greatest impact in providing, expanding, and protecting access to evidence-based education, high-quality healthcare, and system improvement in the U.S. Stone has been in the Coleman family for over seven years. Her previous role was as a CEO of the Susan G. Coleman Greater Atlanta Affiliate. She joined Coleman Atlanta in 2013, almost three years to the day after her own diagnosis of stage three breast cancer. Prior to joining Coleman, Katie was a litigation attorney. Katie obtained her English degree magna cum laude from the University of Southern Mississippi and her GD from the University of Alabama School of Law. Welcome, Katie Stone. Thank you so much, Lorena. And thank you to all of you for being here and for having me. And I have really been impressed with the speakers that we have heard from. I've learned so much from all of you. So Susan and Rayanne and Stephanie, thank you for imparting your wisdom on us. And my favorite thing so far is that every single speaker has talked about collaboration and community and the need to do this work together. And I know that through uh, Komen Greater Central in East Texas and the partnerships that they have with all of, the, all of you represented on this call, you really are doing this work together. And I applaud that and I'm happy to support this work in any way we possibly can. And I say this all the time, we are, cannot be all things to all people individually, but we can, if we collaborate and work together, uh, we can make the impact that we really want to see. So thank you all for being here and for doing all of this work. Um, it's a labor of love, but it's a labor of love together. So today I've been asked to come and talk, just to do a quick overview of Coleman's work and then talk about where we are going into the future. Some of which has been highly influenced by the impact of COVID-19 and some of which we have started all prior to the pandemic, but that really has come to light um, to show us the importance even more during the pandemic. 
So here on this slide, you can see Komen's mission, which is to save lives by meeting the most critical needs in our communities and investing in breakthrough research to prevent and cure breast cancer. On the research side, we're really focusing on finding breakthroughs for the most aggressive and deadly breast cancers. A very large portion of our research portfolio is focused on metastatic breast cancer. And then on the community side of the house, we are working to ensure that all people receive the care that they need. Next slide, please. Here is a slide that, go over our, that goes over our four mission pillars. We just talked about research. Komen is the largest funder of research in the United States, second only to the US government. That's something we're very proud of. We have been supporting research since our founding in 1982, and we are not going anywhere in the research space. We know that to get to the cures, um, this is where we have to be. But we also want to make sure that everyone has access to the care that they need. So we work to eliminate barriers to care, to provide access to vital breast health and breast cancer services. And as the Vice President of Community Health, that is the work that I am doing. And I'm really excited to dig into that and tell you more about it in just a minute. On the community side, we do bring community together. I've heard many of you today talk about how you also bring community together. Um, but we want to make sure that we're providing everything that a survivor, someone living with metastatic breast cancer, a caregiver, or someone who's just interested in breast cancer may need in order to um, make informed decisions about their own breast health. And then finally, we do an awful lot of advocacy on both the federal, state, and local levels to ensure not only research progress, but also protections for all patients. So advocacy for things like the funding for BSEP. And what's beautiful about our advocacy work is while most of Coleman's work is focused on indiv individuals, so providing each individual with the care that they uniquely need, advocacy with the swipe of a pen, if we can get a bill passed, can impact thousands and thousands of people. So it's really important that we work on both of these fronts. And I know that many of you are doing this work too. Next slide, please. Komen has been, was founded in 1982. We've had over three decades of progress, but it is in jeopardy. And I'm, some of this information, Stephanie beautifully went over earlier, but we do expect and are already seeing many more people facing financial challenges as a result of COVID. By the way, many people were facing financial challenges before COVID. It's just worse now. Um, we've seen pandemic related delays in diagnosis and we are expecting to see an additional 10,000 deaths from breast cancer and colorectal cancer over the next 10 years directly related to COVID-19 with the spike being in the next two, one to two years. That's really scary. Um, we've seen diagnostic and screening mammograms decrease over the 80% during the first three months of the pandemic. So that was March, April, May, 80%. I don't know about you in Texas, but here in Atlanta where I live, most of the screening sites were just shut down completely as the, the clinicians were trying to figure out how to safely bring patients in for screening. We're going to see the after effects of that. And then just when we think about general care, we obviously talk a lot about breast care on this call, but we really want best care for everyone. There's been a 50% decrease in visits to primary care physicians. Um, so what else are we going to see outside of the cancer space, other comorbidities that will impact cancer survivorship? Next slide, please. What we're doing, our focus areas for Komen, I think I'm missing, maybe missing a slide here, but we're, there are a couple things that we're focused on moving forward. One is health, eliminating health disparities, particularly eliminating health disparities for black women. And when I was CEO of Komen Atlanta, our entire work in Atlanta through a collective impact model, thank you, Susan, for educating us on that, was focused on eliminating disparities for black women. And we'll start here because this is a focus area for Komen before the pandemic, but we're seeing with the um, additional focus on disparities and racial issues in our country as a result of the pandemic and the unfortunate and horrific death of George Floyd, that black women are more likely to die of breast cancer than white women, 40% more likely. And I'm gonna pause there because I've known this stat for a little while, but every time I talk about it, it's, it's just unacceptable, it's not okay. 40% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. Black women have a lower five-year relative survival rate as compared to white women, are more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age, at later stages, and with more aggressive types of breast cancer. So it's almost a perfect storm 
of problems that have led to this disparity for black women. And then of course, underlying the disparity is systemic racism that our country has allowed to perpetuate for generations and generations. None of these things are okay. It is not acceptable. And we're not gonna stand by and allow this to happen. We have programming happening all across the country specifically focused on disparities for black women. We have an African-American health equity initiative that is working in the 10 cities in the US where the disparities are the worst, but we're not stopping with work in those 10 cities. We're also working in other parts of the country to make sure that these disparities are not allowed to continue. Um, next slide, please. Another part of our looking forward uh, focus is on care services. So making sure that we are providing patients with uniquely what they need, no matter where they live. And we have what we call our Komen Care Services Center, which is focused on providing this individualized care. And in our Care Services Center, which I'll dig into a little bit more um, in just a minute, we have services available for patients to overcome financial barriers to care. So we have a Komen Treatment Assistance Program. We also have a robust Komen Breast Care and Clinical Trials Helpline, which we'll also talk about again. Patient navigation, which we learned a lot from um, many of you and, and Rayanne specific, specifically. And then the provision of high, access to high quality care. So access to BSEP, in, navigation into the BSEP program, access to services, diagnostic care. And then of course, community outreach and education. And I wanna stop there just because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I'm sure many of you working in this space have heard people say, oh, I see pink everywhere and we're aware of breast cancer. We don't need Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I highly disagree. Since Breast Cancer Awareness Month was started in the 1980s, we have seen a 40% decrease in mortality for breast cancer. There were a lot of other things going on that it helped increase that, um, helped the decrease, education, research investments, other things. But what I see Breast Cancer Awareness Month as is a way to educate and re-educate and re-educate our communities about the current advancements in breast cancer care and support and making sure that everyone continues to be reminded that um, breast care is important. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't discriminate. Everyone needs to be aware. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I wish it were, we were a little bit more focused on pushing this messages, these messages out more than just one month of the year. And I know everyone on this call is doing that. Um, but to me, I'm okay with bringing up this awareness piece over and over, as long as there's action behind it. And that's what's beautiful about, again, everyone on this call, you're taking action. You're not just talking about breast cancer, you're making it happen. You're driving impact in your community. Next slide, please. This slide talks about our Komen Breast Care and Clinical Trial Information Helpline. You can see the number there. This is a, a free helpline. It's been around for over 30 years, and it provides not only breast health and breast cancer information, but also psychosocial support, information about local and national resources, support groups. And then seven or eight years ago, we added a clinical trial information um, helpline to the offering of services where people call, ask questions about clinical trials. We help navigate them to understand what trials may be available for them, get them into the clinical trials. Um, we're very proud of this helpline. It really is an entry point for so many people because you don't have to be a current patient um, or a co-survivor to call the helpline. You could be a woman who is well, but worried and call the helpline. So it's a very robust and broad um, array of service offerings through the helpline that also then can get you to some of the other more tailored services that we have at Komen. Next slide, please like our Komen Treatment Assistance Program, which is financial assistance for patients currently in breast cancer treatment. You can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the ex eligible expenses that are provided for the Treatment Assistance Program, and know that these are continually being looked at and evolved based on current times. So as a direct result of COVID-19, we have added food, rent, housing, bills, utilities to this list, and I would, think uh, and know that you will continue to see an evolution of this list. We're also working with um, affiliate leaders, just like the great leaders from Komen Greater Central and East Texas to continue to evolve these programs, to learn from them. What are the needs in your specific community? What can we do to better reach patients? So we're, we might increase the amount of the award, allow patients to access the fund more often. Um, there are 
We're just continuing to see how we can evolve the program. Next slide, please. Oh, and I should have said those services are all available for in, in English and in Spanish. Um, and here you see a snapshot of the Komen website, which provides a wealth of information. And I wanted to put this here for you. This is Komen.org, just to show you that you can get access to the helpline, to the treatment assistance program, and to a wealth of breast cancer education materials right from our website. But I think we've had a little um, mix up with our slides. So one slide that was missing was one that talked about our patient navigation work. And so I'm just gonna pull this up here. And let me, I'm not gonna be able to share it with you, but I can talk you through it. Patient navigation is something that Komen has been involved in for a very long time. And I love that um, we heard a great definition of patient navigation earlier from Ray Ann. And I do think that people tend to approach patient navigation differently, people define it differently. And we're working now on a national strategy to make sure that we are defining patient navigation in a way that is inclusive, but also allows us to help serve patients wherever they live. Um, we do have direct service patient navigation in several markets around the country now. We also are building out patient navigation programs in the top 10 cities where disparities for black women are the highest, specifically focused on black women. But we're not stopping there. We're creating technology now, which we're calling our Komen Health Cloud, which will allow us to offer virtual navigation anywhere. And these type, this type of service will be complementary to the local navigation services that many of you are providing through your healthcare systems and that others will be providing. Just to all, we're going to fill the gap. We're not looking to duplicate services that are already available. We're making sure that our strategy identifies where Komen can best fit in and support the collective. Because again, we're in this together. But we are putting together some really neat technology now that I think patients will appreciate and be able to use not only in conjunction with their current health systems, but even outside of that. We're also working on a peer-to-peer -peer volunteer navigation training program where lay navigators within the community Maybe it's someone associated with the cancer ministry with their faith-based organization can then help provide peer navigation to their peers. Um, we're excited about this. Just the idea of expanding this idea of navigation outside of the professional navigation space. How do we get the entire community involved in making sure that we're getting people into the continuum of care? That's our focus. Um, we're also piloting a community health worker navigation training quality improvement project with our uh, colleagues in Orange County, California. So we'll be able to talk to you a little bit more about that once we get that off the ground, but we're excited to think about how we can better empower community health workers to be involved in this space. And also with the result, as a result of these programs, we're really looking to, to provide a community for lay navigator, so a community where they can share information, offer support to each other. Um, as many of you on the call know, navigating patients is difficult and also emotionally taxing on the navigator themselves. So we wanna be there to provide support and a way for the navigators to build their own community. Okay, next slide, please. So how can you get involved in addition to ways that you are already involved? And I know you, you are each doing so much for a community now, but I did want to give a shout out for the public policy and advocacy work that I talked about earlier. Um, just as I mentioned, through informed government action, we can make the broad systemic and lasting changes we want to see to help end breast cancer. So if we combine our advocacy efforts and those of yours with our local community impact work and the research work, we really can get to a, a place where we're driving even more impact together. And truly public policy, sound public policy um, can improve outcomes and save lives. Next slide, please. So we would just ask you to become an advocate and you can text Komen to 40649. You can also sign up through the website, which will allow you to become an advocate. And what happens with this, it's a pretty slick system, but when a bill is being proposed or we're looking for local um, signers to a bill, Komen will send you a text message or an email with a link and you click the link, it's so easy and it sends it right to the, your representatives and allows you to advocate for public policy that would only, again, not, not only increase funding for research but also increase funding for 
services like access to BSEP and other things. So this is just a great way outside of the way you're already supporting uh, your community to get involved to make a big impact. Next slide, please. Together, we will connect people. Um, and I just wanna go back to the sense of community and we are all in this community together. And I just wanna thank you for making a difference in the lives of breast cancer patients in the communities where you live and beyond. And I've heard you talk a lot about what you're doing locally, but there was also such great thinking about how the work you're doing locally can impact those wherever they live. Um, and I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart as a breast cancer survivor myself, for the, someone who's dedicated my career to this work, um, for everything that you are doing. You are special, you are important, you are making a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie Stone. And thank you for sharing the resources information. And as a Latina woman like myself, we really appreciate the resources are also available both in English and Spanish. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. Let's go over a couple of questions. It is now 10.48, so we have 12 minutes to, over, to go over some questions. And the first one is, what happened to Circle of Pink years ago? Coleman created this group for Black African American cancer patients and survivors. There are circle, it's called Circle of Promise in some communities. In Atlanta, it's called Sisters of Promise. So it may depend on where you live, but those programs are still ongoing. And one of the things that our team, my team with Community Health has been charged with is how to better do it on a national level. We know that engagement locally is important because no community is the same as any other community. So interventions that would be needed in Central Texas would be different than interventions potentially needed in Atlanta. Um, but we also wanna make sure that there's a bigger umbrella so that these individual community groups and volunteers and advocates can connect with one another, share their best practices and create their own sense of community. So we are working on um, a sort of an overarching strategy now. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, there are many of these local groups still operating and making it happen in their local communities. That's right. Thank you. The next one, it says, you mentioned the importance of working together to accomplish our goals during these times. How do community organizations help to support these programs? Well, it's all about collaboration and communication. And one of the things that we're doing, um, as an example, through our helpline is we're working to build out a national program for access to screening and diagnostic services. We're going to be focusing primarily on navigating patients into BSEP. Because again, we want to be a gap filler. We don't want to provide services where services are already being provided. But we know that in some communities, especially in states that didn't expand Medicaid, like Georgia and Texas, that BSEP may not be able to handle all of the load that we can um, deliver there. So we're going to have some relationships set up with national, with local organizations to provide screening and diagnostic services, similar to what um, the great affiliate in um, greater central and east Texas is doing now, but to work together to provide services for those women on a contract basis. Um, that is one example of how we can work together, but it's not the only example. In general, we wanna do this work in partnership with you in partnership with the communities because you and the community know what the community needs best. That's right. I completely, completely agree. So thank you so much, Katie Stone, for all the information and for being with us today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. So I want to thank all of the panelists, experts, attendees, and of course, every member of Susan G. Coleman's organization. It was truly an honor to serve as your moderator today. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. I will now turn the program over to our host, Elisa May. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanted to just bring us back to a couple of slides that we went through pretty quickly. And I wanted our audience to have the opportunity to meet our forum committee. This committee is the uh, committee that actually helped put together the forum. They assisted us in picking our, our topics and delivering the content that we did today. So with that, uh, a special thanks to Erin Hodgins, who is one of our interns from Baylor uh, University. She's been with me since, uh, what, January, and she's been marvelous and, and has been very much uh, a big part of this individual uh, 
uh, committee. And then of course, um, over to my, or to, you can see to the right, right here, we have Bobby Dangerfield. She is a member of our board and has uh, assumed for, uh, I guess for the past year, she's assumed the liaison uh, board mission, liaison person for the board. Thank you, Bobby, for all that you've done. And then Margo Shanks with uh, Baylor University was instrumental in pulling together the partnership that we enjoyed and we were able to get with the university. And of course, Melissa Moreno over with uh, the Moncrief Cancer Institute has also been steadfastly involved with us. And ultimately a special thanks to Rayanne, she sort of double duty. She did uh, both the presentation as well as help us uh, put the committee together. The next slide that we have is our gratitude slide. As you all know, we can't run these programs without having the opportunity to um, have community sponsorships. You know, Katie talked about those sponsorships, talked about the partnerships that are out there that are so critical to our work. And in that, I will tell you that we couldn't have done it without Texas Oncology and the Texas uh, Breast Specialists. They've been involved with us all of this month. We're very grateful to them. And then ultimately our partnership, both with the Baylor University Department of Public Health and um, Department of Public Health, as well as Human Sciences, and ultimately uh, Telemundo for assisting us and allowing us to have uh, the talent that we share today with Loriana. So thank you for all of those individuals that have done that uh, work with us in partnership and in collaboration with the work I do. And finally, I just wanna thank all our partners and providers whom we have had the privilege to work with during the past eight years. Certainly I've been here with you for eight years and um, I can tell you that every single one of you that, that has uh, been a part of the program today and as part of our listening audience, has had a major role in making the Breast Health Network reliable and effective. If it were not for this network, I, I can tell you that probably a lot of women would go um, undetected. I have to tell you that I came to you from the other side of it as a recipient of Coleman Services. This is why I feel so passionate about the work we're doing and the importance of our screening programs and our diagnostic programs. I experienced and witnessed your, your commitment as a network and you were seamless and you were comprehensive. That network in itself is a collective model of working through problems. And so we've been doing the collective model for quite some time, collective impact. Ever since I came here, that's the first thing I saw because I saw how we were actually working and how we actually had developed without whether we knew it or not, we, we had developed a breast health network. So thank you for all of those of you who have been involved with us. And for those of you that, that you know, have been there for me, I appreciate that. For those of you who are there, for the people who have followed us, we are certainly grateful. And most importantly, there will be other people that will continue to come that will need help. And of course, with COVID, we we're, we're want to make sure we're able to provide as much assistance as we can. In the next couple of weeks, I will be reaching out to follow up um, with each of you on some next steps and some person and asking for some personal time with you. I'll also be emailing you to provide you with very important contact information. Uh, to all of those who have joined us this morning, our survivors, our donors, our speakers, our partners, we hope that you walk away with some golden nuggets of information and education that you can use. We, um, we wish you a very happy day today, and we'd ask you to stay safe, wear your masks, and don't forget to vote if you haven't voted yet. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.